Okay, I did turn it on. First Corinthians chapter 12. L- last time in our last study together, we, we, we were looking at a, at a question that I, that I got from, uh, from a brother. He said, wanted me to explain. He said, please, can you please explain, are the sign gifts still being given? And it was in relationship to two passages, Mark chapter, 19, Mark chapter 16, the, the end of the book of Mark. We looked at that last time. And we saw in Mark 16, those sign gifts were given and are not being given any, any longer because the program in which they operated is over with. It's not an operation today. It's been interrupted. So the Mark 16 sign gifts are not being operated. But then the other part of it was, and how about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 to 14? So I wanted to say that and look at that tonight. Because 1 Corinthians 12 is, is a different issue. This is the Apostle Paul. And you start in verse number 1. Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren... And, you know, if, when, if you're familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, if you come back with me in chapter 7, it's in two parts. The first six chapters of Paul giving a, a, a rebuke to the Corinthians for their carnality. Then beginning in chapter 7, now concerning things whereof you wrote unto me. And he begins to answer questions that they had sent to him about things that are going on in the assembly they, they're arguing about. Uh, it is, it, chapter 7 is about marriage. Chapter 8 now is concerning things offered unto idols. Now he's going to talk to him about the, the issue of eating things offered to idols, and that's in chapter 8, 9, uh, 10, and 11. And then in chapter 12, now concerning spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, he talks about now concerning the resurrection. And then chapter 16, now concerning the collection. So they'd, add, they'd sent him a series of questions that they couldn't figure out the answers. They knew he was the one, who, the, the apostle, to ask. And this is a, this is a, it, it's, it was an issue at Corinth that was causing division and, and, and conflict. And here's Paul's instructions to the local church there about the, the, the issue. So now concerning spiritual gifts, my point is he brought it up because it was a problem. They had written to him about it. It was a problem enough for them to seek his advice. And now he's going to tell them how to do things, as he says, decently in order. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant now, that's an important statement. There are six times Paul says, I would not have you ignorant. One other time he says, you're not ignorant. So there are actually seven ignorant statements that he, that he says you're not to be ignorant about. One in 2 Corinthians 2, he, uh, he talks about we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And all the other times he said, I would not have you be ignorant about various things. Uh, ignorant brethren is the world's largest denomination. And Paul said, don't be a part of that. Now, when he says, I would not have you be ignorant, if you come to the end of the passage in chapter 14, there's something specific he wants them not to be ignorant about. Chapter 14, verse number 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now, when he says in verse 38, if any man be ignorant, that is, if any man's going to be ignorant of my authority as your apostle, as the one who gives you the commandments of the Lord, if you're going to be ignorant of that, just let him be ignorant. Just go on in your dumbness. But when he talks about being ignorant and being intelligized, it's going to be in regard to the things that he's taught them. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy... Forbid not to speak in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. There is a decent, a proper way and an orderly way that these things should have, that these gifts should be operated. And the authority that Paul gives them, Paul has given about them, is what's going to set the things in order. So, chapter twelve, verse one, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. That is, I don't want you to be ignorant of my instructions to you about how this stuff works. You know that, verse 2, 12, 2, you know that you, you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were, you were led. So the majority of the Corinthians come out of paganism, and they were carried away under these dumb idols. Now, when it says dumb, it's not talking about stupid. It's talking about, we say deaf and dumb, people that can't speak. Why would you say that an idol is, a, is that idol that can't speak? Because they thought they could. They, the, the pagans, you go back in the book of Psalms, and they, they're getting communications from their idols. They're thinking their gods are communicating to them through the idols. And it says, you were carried away under these 
dumb eye that you thought you were getting communication from those idols. You know better than that now. Wherefore, I, I, I give you to understand, that's the opposite of ignorance, that no man speaking by the Spirit of God. That, now we're going to talk about talking in tongues. So the real problem at Corinth focused around tongue talking. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. That no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. So what you're to do when you hear somebody talking in tongues, you're to test the doctrine that's coming out of it. Not just the, or the, is the, the experience. What are they teaching? What are they saying? Because the test of anything is going to be the sound doctrine that's being communicated. Now, verse number four, now there are diversities of, spirit, of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but the same God. So you've got the Spirit, the Lord, and God the Father. God the, God the Spirit, God the Son, God the, the, God the Father working in their midst, but they all have the same mindset. But the manifestation, the visible evidence that you can see of the Spirit's working is given to every man, notice, to profit with all. The purpose of the gifts, the spiritual gifts, and I, I point out to you in verse 12, verse 1, is concerning spiritual gifts. These are not just sign gifts. The, the ones in Mark 16 were these signs who followed them that believed. But these gifts are more than sign gifts. They're, just, they're more than just signs to the nation Israel. They're, they're, they're the manifestation that the Spirit of God is working in, the, in these believers. And that they're given for the purpose of profiting everybody. Not just one person, not just the person that's got them, but the per you've got a gift in order to pr bring profit to the whole church at large. And then he lists the gifts that he's going to talk about. There are nine of them, verse 8. For to one is given the, by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another, another word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another working of, pro of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another di di diversity of uh, diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and same, same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So it's the spirit of God working these things together, doing it, giving them to the people he wants to have them, doing it according to his will. And the whole purpose of the things is not for an individual's benefit, but for the benefit, the profit of everybody. So that's really important to understand and follow. The profiting is for the whole assembly. Now, we're going to see that more as we get on down into it. Now, in verse 12, he goes, he goes down and talks about the, the, the body of Christ. You, you are the body of Christ. Members in particular, verse 27. How did you become that? You were baptized by the Spirit into one body. Every member of the body has a, has a purpose. One's not better than the other one. They're all necessary, no matter what the, the function and so forth. And there's an equality among the body, but each member of the body has a different contribution to make. And that's the, that's the issue of the, of the profiting with all, with the, the sameness. Well, God puts you in the body where he desires you to be. Then in verse 28, God has set some in the, and in, in, he's going to describe different, different, um, the, the, the diversities of the gifts now. He sets some in the church, first, apostles, second, are prophets, thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Well, the answer to all those is no. Every, everybody knew, knew all of them. You can do the one God gave them. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet, show unto you a more excellent way. So he starts right off the bat by telling them there's going to be something better, more excellent than, than, than this, these spiritual gifts that God's giving at the time. As in chapter 13, he's going to explain what that is. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. There's the gift of tongues. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have 
all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So I can have the gift, and if I don't have charity, which is something other than the gifts, it's just a waste of time. Now, you notice how he, what he's doing in verse, verse 1. He talks about speaking in tongues. Verse 2, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. Well, look back at chapter 12, verse number 8. For to one is given the, the, by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge. Well, in verse number 2, 13, 2, though I have the gift of prophecy, and that's it, that'll be down later on in, in, in the verses up there, but notice, and understand all mysteries. There's the gift of wisdom. And, and all knowledge. There's the gift of knowledge. And though I have all faith, that's the gift of faith, back in chapter verse 12, verse 9. People want to know, what is the gift of faith? Well, he's going to define it for you. So that I could remove mountains and have not charity. I'm nothing. The gift of faith is the, capa- is the capacity to remove mountains. Now, when he says that, he's defining the gift of faith. Come back with me to Matthew chapter 17. The Lord Jesus Christ describes it back here. Matthew chapter 17. Verse number 19. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? That is, the, the devil out of the guy. And Jesus said, Because of your unbelief. For verily a, a, I say unto you, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say hence, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder, and it shall remo- be removed. It shall, it shall remove, and shall not be impossible. Nothing should be impossible unto you. So the idea of removing of faith being the ability to remove mountains is a reference back to what Christ is a clear reference back to what Christ is saying. And what's he talking about? How be it this kind cometh out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Look at chapter twenty one. Chapter twenty one verse twenty one. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say to unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. The gift of faith was the capacity to have miraculous answers to prayer. And even if you had the capacity to have miraculous, you know exactly what to pray for because the Spirit gives you the, will, the, the wisdom to do it and the faith to pray for that and remove the mountain, get the miracle. And if you don't have charity, even though it had this miracle working power, it's of no real value, no lasting value. I am nothing. Didn't mean the other person didn't get a benefit, but I don't have anything. I'm a loser. So the gift and the exercise of the gift is not nearly as important as charity in, in chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse number 3. Though I bestow unto you my goods, all, all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I'm a martyr, and I have not charity, it profits me nothing. So if you're going to look for the more excellent way, what's that more excellent way going to be? Well, it's obviously going to be the way of charity. (coughs) He describes charity in verse 4 to to 7. And then in verse number 8, 13, 8, charity never faileth. The one thing that's never going to end is charity. But whether there be prophecies, and that's going to be the gift of prophecy back in chapter 12. Verse number 10, to another the work of miracles, to another prophecies, the gift of prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation. 
So what he's going to talk to you about in chapter 13, verse 8, are the, are the gifts. Charity doesn't ever end, but whether there be prophecies, the, they shall fail. No, no prediction that God's meant, no, no, nothing God ever pr- prophesied to happen is going to not happen. He's talking about the gift of prophecies. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. There's never going to be a time when people don't talk. He's not talking about just talking. He's talking about the gift of tongues. And whether there be knowledge, there's never going to be a time when people don't know. John 17 says, eternal life is to know thee. Eternal life itself is to know God. You're never going to not, people are never going to not have knowledge and know. But there are going to be a time when, when they don't have the gift of knowledge. So the prophecies, the tongues, and the, and, and the knowledge in verse 8 are the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of, of knowledge. It's the gift program. They're temporary. It's your vanish away. So when it says it's going to fail, they're going to cease, they're going to vanish away. They're not going to operate forever. They're not permanent. But what is permanent? Well, charity is. Verse 13, now abide the faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Charity never ends. So there's going to be a time when the spiritual gifts no longer operate. But charity never stops operating. So, if you're going to invest in something, invest in something that's, that's permanent, not temporary. That's the point. I do these things that don't have charity. These things pass away, and what I got left, nothing. But if I have charity, and I do them with charity, the charity is going to last. And the edification that's brought about by charity. But if you have charity, you're not going to be fighting and contending over these gifts. You're not going to have the... See, they're having these carnal spasms about this stuff. They're faking it. I've showed you before. If you look at chapter 14, verse number 23, when he's, just, when he's setting things in order for them, he says, 14, 23, if, there, if therefore the whole church come together in one place and all speak with tongues. Now, did he give all, everybody the gift of tongues? Chapter 12, verse 28, 29, 30, 31. He said, no, everybody didn't have to get the tongues. Gave it to some people, some people didn't have that. Everybody didn't get all, get all the gifts. Well, if they come together and everybody speaks in tongues, and, he didn't, and God, the Spirit, didn't give everybody the gift of tongues, what are, how, how come everybody's speaking in tongues? Well, some of them are faking it. I was talking to a fellow just this week, and he, he was describing, he said, I used to speak in tongues. And I said, well, that's interesting. How did you learn to do that? And he said, well, I went to it. I got saved. In, in fact, m- most of you guys know this guy. He, he, he's part of the assembly here. He's ill and doesn't get out anymore. He's in his 80s. But uh, he said, when I got saved, I got saved in a charismatic church. And the night I got saved, they told you, now you need to get the evidence of speaking in tongues to have evidence that you're really saved. They said, well, how do you do that? I said, well, you come over here and we'll teach you how to do it. Now, if the Spirit gives you a gift, you don't have to learn how to do it. You see, the, the, the mindset goes away. But if you're going to tongue talk, I went to, uh, what's this guy in Colorado that's on the TV here? Uh, can't, I can't think of his name. Big charismatic guy. And he had a big meeting over here at the uh, Schaumburg Convention Center several years ago. And I went over there one night just to see what was, just to, you know, I, I'm just curious. My wife was in, out visiting the kids in Arizona. I'm by myself, so I'm footloose and fancy free. So I go over there, and I sit there, and there's a big auditorium, maybe 1,200, 1,500 people there. And at the end of it, he gives a, he gives a call, says, you guys come on down and, and, and get your anointing. And, if you want, and, and he gets, gets maybe 200 people down in front of him, and he says, now, God's going to give you the gift of, of, of tongues to give you the evidence of the Spirit of God. Now, he said, it's, 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 it's heresy that you have to keep asking him and asking him and asking him. You only ask him once, Luke 11. Ask him once and he'll give it. You don't have to ask him three or four times. So what's going to happen is one of our counselors is going to come up behind you and they're going to, they're going to pray in your ear and they're going to pray in tongues in your ear and you just kind of mimic what they're saying and you just keep mimicking what you're saying in a minute and, you're and, and pretty soon you'll be talking. Gene said, I got up there and I said, I don't know how to do this. They said, just, you just start talking. Just, just start, 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 
And they'll say, and we say, talk like we're talking. And they said, they're just talking. He said, you know, about 10 minutes of doing that, I'm talking in tongues. I've got a friend in Florida, Grace Pastor. He said, I don't think you can do this. He got a book from, uh, man, I can't remember these guys' names. The COVID, COVID brain. My gift of knowledge is gone. And the guy down in Oklahoma. And he said, I got his book about tongue talking. And he said, here are your instructions. And there's all these. And he said, I sat in my study. And he said, I, I did what the, each instruction said. And I went right down the thing. And when I got down to the bottom, I was talking in tongues. Talking in gibberish. It wasn't a language. And he said, I learned how to do it. And I'm sitting there doing it and saying, I don't believe it. I, I don't believe I can do this. It's not God, the Holy Spirit, giving it to him. It's, you, it's something that you like. That's, that's, that's faking it. That's a phony, baloney kind of thing. That's not God, the Holy Ghost, giving you something that you didn't know how to do and, and impart it to you. That's you learning how to do something so that you can fake it till you make it. They had people doing that. Now, why would they do that? If you look back at chapter 14, verse 1, follow after charity. Desire spiritual gifts but rather that you may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaks mysteries. That's why you have to have an interpreter. Because you don't know what you're saying. Nobody else knows the language. Then it's just gibberish. You have an interpreter. You, you, you never, he says, there's always going to be an interpreter when, when God gives the gift of, of tongues. There's always someone there to interpret it. If there's nobody there to interpret it, God didn't do it. We're going to see that in a minute. That's the order of the thing. So you have, the, you have that, verse number 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to, edify, to edification and exhortation and to comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth who? Who does he build up? Himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. You know who gets exalted when you speak in tongues? You do. You look, you look like God gave you a, a special gift. Why would somebody want to, want, to do, want to talk in tongues? Because they can exalt themselves. It's a pride issue. If you speak words that men understand, prophesy, then you're at a, the church gets edified. Everybody profits from it. I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. See, that's the issue. The gifts are given so everybody profits, not just you. But there are some people there that, are, that they say, hey, these guys get these special positions, and they exalt themselves. So the whole group gets together, and they're just all doing it. And he said, that's, that, that's, that's, that's carnal. That's the carnal. That's the self involved. That's not God doing it. And he's warning them in chapter 13, you guys are putting all your eggs in that basket. Those things are going to pass away. And you better get some charity. Charity works no ill to its neighbor. Charity always brings, brings profit to everyone. Now, if you go back to chapter 13, how long do these things last? Chapter 13, verse 9. And by the way, these things are given that everyone may profit. How does that... You know, profit's still the issue. God still wants... He still wants all the saints to profit. But now we're going to profit in a different way. For we know in part. And we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part is done away. And you know, they, people, what, what is that which is perfect? Well, it's Jesus. It's the second coming. It's heaven. It's all kind of different things. But all you got to do is just settle down, take a deep breath, and read the verse. When that which is in part, that when that's as perfect as come, then that which is in part shall be done away. What's in part in verse 9? Knowledge. We Know in part, we prophesy in part. So knowing in part and being able to prophesy in part because of that is going to be done away. When that which is perfect has come, what does away with partial knowledge? 
complete knowledge, the whole knowledge, the finished knowledge. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, an adult, I put away childish things. The tongues, the gifts, all that stuff is childish. It's, it's childish in the sense that it's for children who don't know everything. But when you become an adult, you don't need that. When you have the complete revelation, you know what Paul says in Timothy, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Where do you get the profit now? You've got a book God put all, he given given you all the information that you'll ever need to know everything God has for you or anyone else to do is in his book. And that's where the prophet is. So we all still need the prophet, but now we all have equal access to it. Verse 12, for now, during the time of verse 9, the partial, we see through a glass darkly. But then, when that which is perfect has come face to face. Now I know in part. That's verse 9. Then, verse 10, shall I know even as I am known. So there's going to come a time when the partial revelation is given away. The complete revelation is there. And when that happens, all the, the spiritual gifts go away because they're no longer needed. Now, if you'll come with me to chapter 14. And, and, and by the way, when that which is perfect has come, that's the full, complete revelation It's, in, it's God's Word. And, you know, there, there's an interesting thing about that. Hold your hand and go with it, Revelation chapter 22. The last thing John says in the book of the Revelation, which is the last thing God says in His Word, Revelation chapter 22, verse, eight, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words or the prophecy of this book. Now, he's talking about the book of the Revelation, but you know when he says it, that's the last verse in not just the book of the Revelation, but the book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If you want to add to the Word of God, you're going to add to yourself the curses found in the Word of God upon those who add to the Word of God. If that book is the complete revelation of God, it's all finished, you have the totality of it, you have that which is perfect, and then you come along and say, well, I've got more messages from God, and I got them through tongue talking, I got them through some spiritual experience. To hold that the Word of God isn't complete and to add to it is a very dangerous kind of thing. It's a dangerous proposition to get involved in those things. Now come with me to chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There are two reasons why the spiritual gifts were at, in, in operation in the church at Corinth. One is chapter 14, verse number 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesy serveth not for those that believe not, but for them which believe. Tongues have a specific function as a sign to unbelievers. Now, in chapter 1, verse 22, he's told us the Jews require a sign. Now, the reason that's important in, in, in Corinth, if you come with, back with me to Acts chapter 18... In Acts chapter 18, when Paul establishes the church at Corinth, (coughs) Acts chapter 18, verse number 4, 
he comes to Corinth in verse 1, meets Priscilla and Aquila there. Verse number 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath day and pers persuaded Jews, the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed. Thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house was joined hard to the synagogue. This is one of the three times in, in, in the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul announces to Israel, you don't want it, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. I'm carrying the message. You've rejected Christ. You've rejected the offer of him as your Messiah and your Savior. I'm turning it. He does that in Acts 13. He does it in Acts 18. does it in Acts 28. So this is a special place in, 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 the, in the record in, in the book of Acts where there's this testimony being made to Israel. They reject it, and he turns to the Gentiles. And he goes right next to and then what says, join heart, the church is... Here's the synagogue. It's like this building, and, and if, it's like a storefront. And right next door is just the one common wall, and there's Justice's house, and they go next door. And they literally go right next door and start the First Grace Church at Corinth. Now, verse number 30. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Crispus the leader, the pastor of the synagogue, the leader of the synagogue, he gets saved. Well, after he gets saved, they call another leader of the synagogue. You read on down in the, in, in the, in the text there. And uh, verse 17, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he adds, Sosthenes, our brother, with him. And you get the picture of what's going on at Corinth. Paul leaves, goes next door, and, and here's the bunch of the Jews and Gentiles. So they, get, they go next door, and they start the Grace Church, and they're having meetings. And the Jews in the synagogue, they hear the people over yonder speaking in tongues and doing other things. And they know that sign belongs to us. Psalm 74 says, we see not our signs. The signs belong to Israel. If they've got them, they're ours and they got them. Well, how come they got them? Paul said, your God has left you gone over here. You don't want him. He's over there. That testimony, their chief ruler gets saved. They called another pastor. He gets saved. I mean, you're having a mass defection over Why? Because of the testimony over there. So the first reason they've got the sign gifts there is a testimony to, to the Jews that through the fall of Israel, salvation gone to the Gentiles. Your God has left you. He's over there. It's a sign to the Gentiles that Israel's God's over here, not over there. So there's a testimony issue there that is similar to what the purpose of them in Mark 16 is. But there's also, God doesn't just do a gibberish thing over there with them where, where his purposeless. He uses those, sign, those spiritual gifts in their midst. The gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom, the gift of, of prophecy, and, and the gift of tongues. So he uses them in their midst because they don't have the complete revelation yet. They don't have the complete word of God. He's, Paul doesn't have it all yet. He's still going to come to visions and revelations to the Lord. He says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Lord has progressively given Paul this information. The way that information is disseminated Come with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And this is a passage that sometimes people don't really pay a lot of attention to. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you, how that by revelation he, that's Christ, made known unto me the mystery. Christ himself personally reveals this information to Paul. As the world forms your words, where when you write, you may understand the knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Well, that's not the same as verse 3. 
Christ reveals it directly to Paul. And then as Paul preaches it, the Spirit of God then reveals it to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Were there apostles and prophets at Corinth given by the Spirit of God? Yeah, he said there are. First is prophet, apostle. Once the revelation is given to Paul, now the Spirit of God can take that information and give it to all the apostles and prophets, all the teaching ministries, all over the body of Christ. They didn't have telephones. They didn't have telegraphs. They didn't have internet. They didn't have the instant communication that we have today. And there are people watching watch our internet things, and, and, and they're just all over the world. We were down in Florida in January. My wife taught at one of the ladies' meetings down there. And that afternoon, she gets a, a, an email from somebody in Africa, scared her to death. She says, how can somebody in Africa hear me talk? I said, it's on the Internet. We hear that. You, you hear that. We, you see that. We see that all the time. Just instant. They didn't have that. But once the information was revealed by Christ to Paul, now they have, they have the, the, the spiritual gifts in all these churches. They have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And those spiritual gifts, now the Spirit of God can reveal the information to them because it's been made known by Christ to Paul and then by the Spirit of God talk to the others. So there is a teaching ministry. There's an edification ministry being provided for the body of Christ to provide all of the information to all of the saints. And so that, that second issue, and that's why you come down to chapter, chapter 14, and you come down to verse 26. Because in the, in the, in the, or, you have to have the orderly distribution. You see what he said down in verse, verse 40? Let all things be done decently and in order. There is an, the Spirit of God doesn't do this haphazardly. Verse 26. How is it? 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. That's the decency. The way it's done properly is for everybody to profit with all through, that, through, through edification. Not just a bunch of, of, of personal exaltation. Not just a bunch of experiential things. And, and listen, when people want to fight against what I'm saying... It's always based upon, well, I experienced this, I've seen that, or the other thing. You're, what you've experienced, if your experience is the basis of your faith, your faith is on sand, on shifting sand. Your faith needs to be based upon the truth of God's Word, rightly divided. And if your system doesn't match the verses, then let your system be adjusted by the verses. But your experience has to reflect the working of the verses not the other way around. Now here's the order. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. And let him speak to himself and to God. So if you're going to have a tongue-talking meeting... No more than three people can talk in tongues in that meeting. And they don't talk on top of each other. They talk in order. One talks, and then it's interpreted. And if there's not an interpreter, God didn't do it. That's pretty clear. Next person talks, the interpreter, and everybody gets the edification. But if... If, if, if it didn't... If, if the fifth and fourth and fifth and sixth people, or people talk over each other... The disorder, the chaos that didn't want God created. Verse 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let others judge. And if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let him first hold his peace. For we may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. The order is going to be there. You're not going to have this, this, this uh, jamboree going on. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Now, here, here, here's a killer verse. Let your women keep silence in the church. Uh-oh. 
Now, that verse has been abused down through the years. I, I knew a guy years ago, he, he wouldn't let his wife say hello to somebody in the church building. And I used to say, well, man, you, you're nuts. <laughs> and, and you're also kind of brave. But uh, that's not what it's talking about. Let your women keep silence in the church. What's the context? The context is talking in tongues and prophesying. You see verse number 27, if any man speak in tongues, the only people authorized to speak in tongues in the assembly are the men. And if women do it, they're not doing what... It's not, God the Holy Ghost isn't going to speak to the women in the assembly. Let your women keep silence. No women tongue talkers. That verse right there would sink the charismatic movement just like that. Because it's carried on the back of women tongue talkers and women preachers. Let your women keep silence in the church. If it, if it be, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. That is to speak in tongues. You ladies can, you know, say, hey, how y'all doing? What are you, you going to have for lunch? What do you think about this verse in the Bible? You can talk all you want to in the fellowship of the saints. The speaking is speaking in tongues. But they are commanded, commanded to be under obedience. It's also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. It's a shame for a woman to speak in tongues in the church. So the Pentecostal charismatic movement is a shameful thing. We're to, we're to, verse 40 says, let all things be done decently, not shamefully, and in order. 36, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? No. For if any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual. If you think you, you speak for God, you got a revelation from God, God speaking through you, if that's what you think, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you, there's the word, can't change that, can't misunderstand, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Anybody led by the Spirit of God would recognize that Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles through whom Christ has given the instructions for us today. And if any man be ignorant of my authority, my, 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 my rules, let him be ignorant. Just, you know, if, you, if you're just going to be dumb, go be dumb. But we don't have that kind of tradition in the church. That's not who we do. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. So, are the spiritual gifts in Corinthians still in operation today? No, they were needed at the time. It's like the ones in Mark 16 were appropriate in Israel's program at the time. That program's been interrupted, so they're not needed. They're not in operation today. These gifts were needed at the time. One, it's a sign of, of, of the fall of Israel's salvation going to the Gentiles. But two, as a means to communicate and keep the body of Christ up to date in Revelation as it's being given until the Word's been written. And once the written Word of God is available, now you don't need them the prophets for everyone through the written word of God. So you and I have the completed revelation of God's word today, of God's will today, in written form, and you don't need these things. The way you can know for sure that these gifts aren't in operation today is they don't operate according to the rules that he set down. When God was doing them, the order is there. And the lack of that order. And listen, I've seen people have that pointed out to them and try to shape up their group and say, well, well, we'll do it accordingly. But you know what happens? You give them a few months and the chaos comes back because it's not God doing it. I tried to say to you this morning, the life of Christ living through you is not something you, you, you do yourself. It's something he does. It becomes the spontaneous communication, the communion that you have with him as you lean upon him, as you trust in him, as you lean into who you are in him, as you take his mind and let it be your mind. And it's his life. It's not you just living out, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show the Lord how thankful I am for him and do these things for him. You fall flat on your face. But when it's his life, then it's different. And when you're trying to do these things, 
and you're trying to do things that he isn't doing, you wind up making a mess of it. And the confusion that's there, and the, the confusion and the carnality at Corinth call, gets caught up in all of this. And it brings havoc. And it wrecks, wrecked havoc in the church of Corinth. It's wrecked havoc in the evangelical world today. J.C. O'Hare said back in the late 1940s, if the, if the, evan, the fundamental evangelical church refused to go on with the, in, into an understanding of the, of, of the distinctive ministry of Paul and the revelation of the mystery of grace given through him, that, that they, the church, evangelical church would be uh, chastised with the rod of Pentecostal fanaticism. And that's come to pass. And there's little, little, little else has destroyed evangelicalism. A uh, little more has destroyed evangelicalism than this, this confusion that's gone out through the midst of it. I can remember as a, as a young believer the, uh, the depth of study and teaching that was available. Even in Acts 2 dispensationalists who hadn't really, who, 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 who were uh, from the first part of the last century, who, who were coming in to understand things, and they had an understanding and a grasp and a grip and a grip on the foundational truths of, of grace. And there's nothing like that for a young preacher today. Those things are a thing of the past. And the heroes of the faith today are, I don't want to say Bible ignoramuses, but I'll say they're Bible ignoramuses. They're uh, dispensational, dispensationally nil. And when you don't understand God's word right divided, your option is to be a Calvinist, an amillennialist, somebody that doesn't take the Bible seriously, but makes theology his guide. And when you make theology your guide, you make the, council, the church councils, you make church tradition your guide. And now you're, 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 you're going back to the church fathers to get their, your doctrine out of books of the church fathers, not out of an understanding of God's word. And that's where, that's where evangelicalism today, and that's why evangelicalism is, is, is so vacuous. The reason, and you can try to blame it on everything in the world, but the reason that yesterday when the White House had a Easter egg party, Easter egg hunt, they put a memo out and said, you can't, you come for the Easter egg hunt, but you can't put any religious symbols on your posters or your Easter eggs. Well, Easter is a religious holiday, but no longer. Easter is a, critic, is a Christian holiday, but no longer. You can't have an Easter egg, which is a pagan religious symbol, but you can't put a cross on it. And you say, well, how in the world can America do that? Well, separation of church and state. And you say, what? And you say, where did that come from? Well, where's the church? Where's the body of Christ? They're over here in the corner screaming and hollering and saying, don't do that to me. Instead of having the ability to go out and put the life of Christ and the, and the love and grace of God into the culture and win that culture by the truth of his grace and the, and, 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 and the impact of his presence. And where, where, did, where did it become a sham? Well, you go, back, you go back and look through history in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and you say, what, what took over? What we've been talking about. O'Hare was right. And the evangelical church has just been scourged, but it's been gutted by the rod of Pentecostal fanaticism. The church of Corinth was that way. The answer is be you followers of me even as I am of Christ. Okay, praise the Lord. I'm not taking it out on you guys. You already know this, right? Okay. But I, I say that, and look, there, there are folks watching on the internet, and this, this you know, I, I get, I get blowback all the time. I, you know, I have people. I, I have no expectation that people are going to love and enjoy me, my ministry all over the world. I got, I, I got sense enough to know that. And uh, it, I mean, I appreciate folks that do, but uh, when you do, you better be ready for, you know, get your cage rattled, and that's okay. But the truth is, if you, want the, if you want grace to live in your life, you go to Paul's epistles and get it out of there. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace and for the opportunity to fellowship together with folks that appreciate that and that uh, desire to make it known to others. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord.